Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Ofer. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I work on helping companies become more productive using Google's open source ecosystem. Uh, so, today we're going to talk about knowledge transfer by source code. And that is about how you transfer knowledge, so things you know about the code base, about your project, to other people across your company, on your team. Now, these techniques that I'm going to show you today, they're secret techniques uh, used inside Google. And I say secret like this because it's all open source. And it's based on Google's open source tools. And you can actually go ahead and do the same things uh, right after you get out of the conference, uh, those of you with the laptops, even as we speak. Uh, so let's start. Uh, OK, but actually, before we start, I added a few slides uh, to this deck uh, today, because uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Bazel speed. So we've talked a, a lot about um, how Bazel is fast, and it can actually uh, compile much, much faster. This is a, um, an evaluation done by Wix, where they found that uh, Bazel is, uh, decreases the build time from 45 minutes to just five minutes. And, and you know, it seems like a good thing, but you need to think about this when you think about using Bazel. Because if you think about those 45 minutes, and maybe you're used to doing things in that time, like maybe uh, staring at a screen, and, you know, and now that you're using Bazel, you don't have that time. And you know, some of you have been t telling us that uh, staring at the compiler makes it go faster. So Bazel doesn't work that way. And so uh, you won't be able to do that. Uh, there's no time for knitting while the compilation is going on. And uh, if you are waiting for the build and you're used to doing some other stuff in the meanwhile, so you won't have that chance with Bazel. And uh, if you love multitasking and doing like five tasks at the same, si at the same time, then uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work so well, because Bazel is just too fast for that. Uh, so besides being fast and correct, uh, what, uh, what can Bazel help you do along with Google's other uh, open source technologies? So we're gonna give, I'm going to give several examples, but the focus is going to be about knowledge transfer, which is a problem of transferring knowledge across your organization. Now, when you think about knowledge transfer, there's two basic types, and it's like a scale between them. There's personalization, uh, which is one-on-ones and chats, and it's basically a synchronous way of transferring knowledge. And there's codification, which is about uh, code comments and wikis and docs. And that is uh, async in its nature. Now, personalization, it doesn't scale, because you can talk to one person, you can talk to two, three, maybe 10 people. But many more than that, it's not going to scale well. Um, and it requires you to be present. Now, codification, writing comments, writing wikis, that scales well to a lot of people, but it takes a lot of effort. And it's not an inherent part of the code, and that, that way it can become um, you know, not up to date. And it's always confusing to make sure that the documentation is really connected to the code. So at Google, the way we tackle knowledge transfer is basically with two basic um, strategies. So first of all, we try to simplify where we can our systems, and we try to codify not only using wikis and docs, also through source code. And that's going to be the main part of the talk, and I'm going to give some examples on that. So first of all, about simplification. So at Google, we have uh, one style guide, one operating system for developers, one repository, one data format, one server communication protocol, and uh, one build tool. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Bazel. OK, uh, this is a simplification, but for the most part, it's correct. Now, uh, when you think about uh, you know, focusing on codifying by source code, I'm going to talk about three main technologies, protocol buffers, gRPC, and Bazel. And they're basically the equivalent of JSON, HTTP, and make files. Now, who here works with protocol buffers? OK, I'd say about half. Who works with uh, gRPC? OK, maybe a third. Um, 
Okay, so, and who's, who's uh, thinking about working with Bazel? Not yet working with Bazel. Okay, actually most of you are. So uh, these technologies are very mature. They've been used inside Google for more than 10 years, and they're used on a day-to-day -day basis by Googlers. Now, I just want to say that there's other options that exist to do the same concepts that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to explain with these ones, but other, uh, obviously there's other libraries out there, and you can do the same things or similar things with uh, other libraries. So uh, protocol buffers. Uh, you have a protodef file uh, with the structure of your data, the data that's going to be passed around. And that can be passed around with uh, various formats. You have JSON, standard, proto.txt, which is a textual format, and proto.bin, which is the binary format. It's compact, it's efficient, and also when the data gets transferred there, it gets transferred uh, without the field names. It, for example, in this example, there's title with the ID 1. So in the data that gets transferred, the, the string title never gets transferred. It's always, uh, it's always um, uh, the IDs that get transferred. And this is an important point that uh, I'm going to talk about later. So remember that. Uh, now, uh, the proto.txt format, um, anyone ever seen it before? OK. So um, I marked the annoying characters in red, OK? Annoying characters are the characters you don't want to deal with because you just want to deal with the actual data. Now, if you compare it to JSON, there's actually many, many more annoying characters, and there's more types of them. For example, there's commas, and there's um, parentheses, which you don't have. So there's two types of parentheses instead of just one. So it's just built to kind of confuse you just, just enough to, uh, to not be able to parse it later. Uh, so that's proto.txt. And uh, also protocol buffer generates code for you. So uh, you get for every language uh, that is supported, and there's many languages that are supported, you get code generation. For example, with Java, you get these objects for free, which, ha which have getters, setters, and a lot of functions, uh, related functions uh, that come with them. Now you can think of protocol buffers as a strongly typed JSON. So when the message changes, the code that's using the message, that's reading the message, won't compile anymore. And in a mono repo, you can actually change the front end. You can have a setup where a front end and a back end both use the same protocol buffer. And once you change that, the other side stops compiling, and you have to update it too, so you never forget, and you never break the other side. So uh, now we're going to go to the fun part of the talk. Uh, there's going to be a lot of examples of day-to-day uh, scenarios which you may have encountered uh, as part of your work. And uh, it's kind of like Seinfeld, uh, but for uh, developers. So um, think of this scenario. Uh, there's Newman. He's the new guy on the team. And uh, he's working with the book class. And uh, the book class has uh, two fields uh, that he's worried about. There's title and there's actual title. And uh, he recently uh, moved from uh, the show business to being a developer. And uh, now he has to um, work on this new task. And he can't figure out like what's the deal with this title, an actual title. So uh, he asks Debbie. And Debbie's an, a senior developer on the team. And, and what she says is that uh, everybody gets confused. So initially, we had title. And then it was just for display purposes. And it was truncated. And then we needed to add another field which is the real title. But we couldn't change the name of the old title because we already have released apps that people have, and they need to continue working. So we, had, we just made another name, and uh, that's how we named it, because title was already taken. So Newman uh, sends back this emoji. It's not a smiling emoji, uh, because you know it's a little bit confusing. So with protocol buffers, you can actually rename stuff. Uh, you want to add a new field. so. You can add this. Um, you can add a field by. You can rename the existing field and add a new field with the old name, and that still works. That's a green check there. And uh, the w the w the reason it works is that the data being transferred in binary format never includes the title string. It always includes just the ID one, and that's going to continue on transferring even if you change that name. Um, now, for free, you also get enums across all the languages. So you don't have to communicate changes 
and transfer this knowledge of from the back end to the front end from between teams about enum changes. So you get these for free. Um, now, let's look at Fred. Fred is, uh, Fred is working on a new field called ISSN. He's not sure what ISSN is. Um, anybody know what ISSN is? Okay, I, I checked when I made this slide, but I kind of forgot since then. It's something like international number for something, something with books. I don't know, Fred doesn't know either. Fred is gonna ask Becky, what is ISSN? And uh, Becky is, happens to be in a meeting. Uh, maybe she's on vacation. Maybe she's in the Bahamas and uh, on extended vacation. And uh, now Fred can't actually continue because he doesn't know what ISSN is. Now he can dive to the server code, but he's a front-end developer. And uh, maybe it's in another repo and he's not sure which branch it is. And he kind of finds the code and maybe it's documented, maybe it's not really ver very good documented very well. So with protocol buffers, there's just one file and everybody's looking at the same file. And there's a clear, a good way to, a good place to put this documentation. Uh, now the next scenario is uh, with, about gRPC. So uh, gRPC is like uh, a communication protocol between servers, kind of like HTTP, but based on protocol buffers. So Becky has this new endpoint for this new feature it's called uh, Cool Server Pizza Order. And uh, Fred now needs to work on it. And for Fred to work on it, he needs a lot of stuff. He needs uh, a running dev server so he can check what this endpoint looks like. And uh, this running dev server, maybe Becky forgot to bring it up. Maybe she went on vacation. Uh, maybe she brought it up, but there was an electricity shortage, and now it's down again. Maybe it's up, but he's not sure it's the same, it's a correct version that he's looking at with the code. Uh, and maybe he doesn't know what the endpoint is, what the uh, address is. But let's assume he has all that. So all this is like knowledge transfer. He's, he ne he's needing Becky's help to do his job. But let's assume he has his server up and running. So he still needs to kind of query the server to see what the response looks like. And it's returning this JSON, and he needs to kind of figure out and kind of reverse engineer and things that Becky already knows, knowledge that she already has, is not properly encoded in the code base. So he needs the server up and kind of to query it. And he can actually make some uh, mistakes because he's querying with certain requests. But maybe there's other requests that will bring more fields in. And he's not taking that into account when he's doing his front end work. So uh, with gRPC, what you can get is basically a definition of what the server, what the server endpoint looks like, and what its requests and response looks like, look like, and uh, this is part of the this is built on protocol buffers, and it's part of the gRPC. Um, it's part of the definition file, and you also get a client code generated for free and server code generated for free. So that's really convenient, and it takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Um, now let's talk about Bazel. So. Bazel, uh, basically it democratizes builds across the company. So now everyone can build everything and see everything buildable. Uh, in this example, Jared is uh, working on this tool and uh, he's kind of stuck. He's a, a junior developer on the team and he's kind of stuck. He's uh, getting this weird compilation error and he's not sure what to do. And he's asking Jevy. Jevy's an experienced developer. She's a couple of years on the team. And uh, she actually can't reproduce the issue because it's, it's not based on Bazel and uh, she has a different environment. And so she can't help him and she can't transfer her knowledge to him in an effective way. So with Bazel, uh, everything, you have this reproducibility and it makes helping other people in your company easier. Now, uh, now Jared actually successfully built his tool. And now he's built this tool and he's telling everyone, listen, this, this great tool. Uh, at Google we have this great tooling culture where people can build tools and share them with the, with the company. And it's really easy. And the reason is that, that, that it's easy is because we are using Bazel. And so in this example, Jared has made this tool and uh, he just shared it, shares it with Patty and Patty's a Python developer and Gordon, and Gordon's a, a Go developer, and they can all use it for different purposes. Now, without Bazel, 
what Jared would have had to do is uh, tell Patty about this tool, cool tool, and then uh, build an executable for her and maybe email it to her. And she's excited and she shares it around and, and people ask him about it. So he puts this in a shared folder and then people can get it from there. And they use it and it's popular and they copy it to different places. And now Jared has uh, some requests to make changes. So he makes changes and he makes another version. But then there's all these versions tr uh, like traversed across the company. And now there's different versions and people uh, say there's some issues. And then he figures out it's this old version. So now he has multiple versions he's kind of supporting. And uh, they want to make changes and they don't know exactly how because they're not Java developers and it's hard for them. They don't even have the build tools to do that. And uh, now he ends up kind of, as part of his job is to support this tool that he doesn't really want to be in like a big role of support for. And, and with, with Bazel, you don't have to compile it. You just tell people how to build it and they build it themselves. They don't need the tooling to be installed and stuff like that. You don't need to manage executables. So it's much, much more easy to share, to share tooling across the company. Um, so it, Bazel makes tools, tool sharing easy. Now, um, let's talk about this other uh, scenario where Becky and uh, Fred are um, at the same company but at different teams, all right? And uh, Fred's team has been doing some awesome work and uh, they build the, these cool libraries and Becky just found one of them and she wants to use them. Uh, and it's basically, it saved her like a week of work and she's really happy about it. And she starts using it, and uh, maybe she tells Fred, maybe, maybe she forgot, maybe she's not sure she should. And uh, now Fred is going to change that code. Maybe he even has a branch waiting to be merged to change that code. And he breaks Becky's code. And he breaks it in at a time where it's not convenient for her. Maybe she's going to release now, she needs to update the dependency, and it's not a convenient time. And uh, what you have with Bazel, is that you have the visibility uh, attribute for folders and for targets. And that way you can actually control uh, who can use which code. And different teams can say, all right, this folder, this is our folder, this is our team's folder, and you can't use it unless you explicitly ask for permission. And that is a conversation you want to be having because that's a point in time where you can talk about uh, what it means to use that code and how we collaborate on that code and what, owner, what about ownership? What about changes to that code? What about the time span of how, how long that code is gonna be living and the release process and timing for that, that releasing that code? Uh, so Bazel helps uh, sharing code across the company easier. And what many companies do to solve this is actually silo up different teams and different teams are working on different repositories so you don't have that kind of uh, dependencies that might break things, but then you can't share code as easily, right? Um, the next example I want to show you is about Patty, who just wants to make a small change in a web app, and she's a Python developer. Now, uh, Jess, who is a JS developer, he's like, yeah, sure, like, he's optimistic. Uh, Patty, what experience do you have with web development? And she's, yeah, I built this HTML website for my parents once in high school. And he's optimistic and he's like, all right, so uh, you can go ahead, just uh, install uh, Gulp and CSS and uh, NPM and Goglify and uh, NG and Webpack and you're ready to go. And uh, yeah, you can see that this generates some uh, friction for uh, Patty in making these small changes. So Bazel actually lowers barriers between teams in a way that if you wanna make a change in a another team's code that is not on in your like proficiency language, you can do that and uh, you don't have to wait for them to actually do that on their cycles. You can do that on your cycles and it's, if, if it's important to you, you can prioritize it. And uh, that makes, uh, that lowers the barriers for cooperation and uh, removes friction between, between teams across platforms and languages. So uh, some key points I want you to take from this, uh, from this uh, deck is think about how you in your team, in your company, encode knowledge, okay, in your code. 
And uh, how, how easy is, is it for others to understand and use it? Think about how others can build, test, and run code across teams, how they can use the API that other teams are uh, opening up, and uh, how easy it is, is it to share code and tools across the company. Now, um, if you have questions, uh, you, can, um, you can ask me, of course. And uh, there's also I have a little bit more time, so uh, we'll keep questions in, uh, to the end. I have something else I want to talk about. Um, you can look at this repo called the Startup OS, which is a template for our repository uh, for a company, which is what your repository for your company could look like using Bazel, gRPC, and protocol buffers. And it has several best practices on how to use these technologies, as well as some others. And uh, also, uh, if for startups, there's this uh, cloud credits program. You're uh, welcome to sign up. Um, and now I want to talk about um, I have this kind of mini lightning talk instead of this talk. Okay, So uh, I want to talk about um, a code review tool that's related to Google's technologies and makes it easier to use uh, Google's technologies. Uh, but not only Google's technologies. It's called uh, Reviewer, and it's a multi-repository code review. So um, why, why is it important? Why do you need a, a code review tool, uh, especially a multi-repo code review tool? So uh, you think about protofiles. Where do you put these protofiles? We've had a lightning talk yesterday about how managing protofiles across dependencies uh, is challenging. And uh, how you have the multi-repo multi and monorepo uh, workflows and how that is different. And uh, dependency hail. Uh, which is, um, you know, it can uh, make uh, dents in your uh, flow and uh, actually break you in production. So uh, how do you, how can you make all of these uh, easier? So, uh, so this tool can help you. Uh, so basically, it's a code review tool, and it's uh, multi-repo. So this basically it looks like a standard code review tool. It's it's built, uh, it's inspired by Google's internal uh, code review tool. And um, these are just uh, pictures of what it looks like. Okay, just a standard tool. Uh, now, it's, what is interesting about it? It's multi-repo. Uh, multi-repo means that you can actually have one PR that makes changes across multiple repos, okay? And uh, these, uh, these PRs, this tool can actually do atomic commits across these repos. And uh, it is um, hosting agnostic, which means that you can actually work with repositories hosted on GitHub, GitLab, on-prem, uh, Bitbucket, uh, Google Cloud repositories, um, and others. And uh, it's currently it's supporting Git, but it's built to be uh, extensible to Mercurial and Piper and others. And uh, it supports uh, private repos in an interesting way where you can actually have like two repos, right? It's multi-repository, so you can have two repos, one private and one public. And uh, the private repo, when you do code review, when you look at the tool, you see changes from both repos. And you can collaborate on your public repo, which is open source, with someone outside your company. And they can only see the public code and not your private code. And it's secure. In, a sen in, in that way, and I'll, I'll talk about why it's secure in that way. Um, and uh, you can view local changes without pushing the code to GitHub or to uh, whatever host uh, provider. Now, how it does all that is uh, this is the architecture. So you have the Angular app in the middle there, and uh, it's get, it gets the metadata, metadata from Firestore, and it actually gets the files, the code, and the diff from a locally running server. So no code actually gets uh, off of your machine at any given time, which is why you can actually work with private and public repos and stay secure. Um, and then it gets uh, the, the data from Git. And that's why basically it's ba it basically works with the Git protocol. That's why it can work with various hoster, hosting providing providers. Uh, and that's basically like the architecture. Uh, yeah, and that's it. I see the star is 
removed from where it should be. Uh, but that, that should mean that you can start the repo. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, happy to take any questions.